The question is the amendment be agreed to. I now give the call to the member for Longman. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise tonight to speak in opposition to the Clean Energy Amendment Bill 2012. And it is an honour to follow the member for Forest and her eloquent contribution to this House tonight. In just three short months, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have seen this Labor government move from one policy failure to the next cruel carbon tax policy failure. This is a tax that was desperately thrown together in a political arrangement with the Greens. It is a tax that, at its heart, is designed to change behaviour by hurting Australians in the hip pocket and, in the process, making small business uncompetitive. The carbon tax is indicative of the failure of the administration that taints this federal Labor government. After a dismal record in administering programs, be they the $900 checks, pink bats, school halls or set-top boxes, the carbon tax, like these programs, is off to a very poor start. In just three short months, we have seen eight, eight major structural changes to the way this tax will work. First, we saw a government bail out companies using taxpayer funds. Then we saw Labor cut the share of clean technology investment grants funding available for small businesses, simultaneously increasing the funding available for big business. Then, just weeks later, we saw the entire program halted. Along the way, we have watched the big polluters list ebb and flow at the whim of the government, with more businesses added and taken off and then added again. And we know that currently the big polluters list is sitting around a total of 315 businesses. Later, we witnessed Labor change the regulations around the carbon tax, which had what we can imagine must be the unexpected result of actually increasing real emissions from pipelines and landfill by one million tonnes. Again, we saw another change with Labor abandoning the contract for closure program. Additionally, we have seen this Labor government boast that their floor price for the carbon tax was absolutely essential. And now, this is one of the raft of changes we are debating here tonight. We are in the process of seeing the government completely scrap their essential floor price. A floor price that the Prime Minister called wise and government ministers repeatedly defended labelling a floor price as a safety valve and a tool to provide participants with greater certainty. Tonight, we are also seeing those opposite try to jump on the EU bandwagon attempting to hitch the carbon tax to the European Emissions Trading Scheme, putting Australian businesses at a distinct disadvantage to overseas businesses. As the Leader of the Opposition pointed out tonight in this chamber, while we all love our European cousins, their culture, their history and their contribution to Western society, we don't necessarily want to be hitching ourselves to their economic policies. It is something akin to putting the Australian dollar into the EU zone currency. These many changes have been mooted since the carbon tax was brought in on 1 July of this year. With so much unclear about the carbon tax, there is only one thing that is clear. It is clear that this Labor government has lost control of its own policy, and there is no direction from this federal Labor government. The carbon tax has taken on a life of its own, and this Labor government cannot seem to predict where it is taking them. The raft of structural changes that are seen in these seven bills makes it abundantly clear that this is a Labor government once again making decisions on the run. This is a government that has continually failed to recognise the implications of the carbon tax and is attempting to bu apply band-aid solutions to the injury that the carbon tax is causing on Australian businesses and families. In the government's regulation impact statement, it is revealed that for some small businesses, the potential change in treatment of international units may create additional administrative costs. Small businesses are already being hit hard by the carbon tax, with absolutely no assistance from this federal Labor government. And now those opposites are trying to make, it, to make changes to put even more pressure on small business. Small business is the engine room of our economy, the great creator of wealth and the great employer in our nation. It would seem to me, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is a reality 
that this Labor government is determined to deny, and as is set out on making it more difficult for small businesses to get ahead. In light of all we know about the failure of this Labor government when it comes to the carbon tax, the government still arrogantly refuses to change the modelling for the carbon tax. Despite making a raft of changes to the way the carbon tax operates, this Labor government is standing by its modelling. This government is relying on flawed modelling to sell its failed carbon tax to the Australian people. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, based on this government's track record, it is highly unlikely that the outcome of this tax will look anything like the spin the Labor Party is trying to sell to the Australian people. Mr Deputy Speaker, one of these serious structural changes is the idea to link the carbon tax with the European scheme. I have serious concerns about these intentions. Clearly, the government has acted in a desperate political act by introducing this legislation before having a formal agreement with the European Union. Such a move would effectively link Australia's economy with the highly risk risky and unstable European economy at a time when Europe's economic judgment is under intense scrutiny. Additionally, the European scheme is well known to have been rorted. This Labor government wants to marry our own carbon tax with this failing system. This move could have huge implications for our economy, and there is no guarantee that the carbon tax and therefore the Australian economy won't be taken of advantage by, by fraudsters. After only three months of this carbon tax, Mr Deputy Speaker, the real implications are becoming clear. In my electorate, I have been speaking with many local businesses who are expressing very sincere concerns about the future of their business due to the impacts of the carbon tax. They are stating, starting to find out the hard way exactly what it means for them. Two weeks ago, I visited Allied Timber Products, a manufacturing business in my electorate with the deputy leader of the opposition. And I spoke with Richard, the managing director of Allied Timber Products, extensively about his business and the concerns he had about the carbon tax. In electricity alone, Richard is facing a $40,000 carbon tax charge this year. This does not include haulage costs or any of the other numerous costs through which Richard is also facing a carbon tax charge. And Richard looks at this carbon tax cost in terms of his ability for his business to grow. He told me that the carbon tax he is paying is directly negating his ability to employ one more person in his business. For a region such as mine that are already experiencing a significant unemployment rate, Richard's news is nothing short of disappointing. I don't want to see government get in the way of Richard's ability to run his business, and I don't want to see government hinder Richard's ability to grow his business. It is clear from what, from what Richard is saying that the carbon tax is doing just that. The carbon tax is already costing jobs in my region. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have said it many times in this place before. New and increased taxes <coughs> don't create jobs and don't create wealth. And as much as the modern Labor Party might like to deny it, you cannot tax a nation into yeah. greater prosperity. During my visit to Allied Timber Products, I sat down with Richard to have a look at his electricity bills from both before and after the carbon tax. And what surprised me was that oh, although Allied Timber Products have done the right thing, they've taken efficiency measures and they've reduced their electricity consumption, they are still paying a massive carbon tax bill. Mm -hmm. Let me just make this point very clear. This local business is using less electricity but paying a higher electricity mm -hmm. bill because of the carbon tax. And due to current market pressures facing the timber industry, this carbon tax cannot be passed on. Allied Timber Products is forced to try to absorb this cost, making this family-owned business less viable. Mr Deputy Speaker, earlier this week, another local business relayed its concerns to me about the carbon tax. Local car dealership owner John Page shared with me information about the carbon tax and the effect it is having on his car dealership. The cost is quite sizeable. On John's electricity bill, he is paying increases of up to 30 per cent on electricity charges due to the carbon tax. John de describes the carbon tax, and I quote, a hit on small businesses that have absolutely no right of reply. 
Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, John is absolutely right. Unlike some of the big polluters, small businesses can't pass on their carbon tax cost and they don't get compensated for it. Recently, I, I spoke with another business owner who was in the process of closing her fish and chip shop and convenience store. Sadly, she had become yet another victim of this federal Labor government's carbon tax. After receiving a couple of post-July electricity bills and seeing just how much the carbon tax had increased her cost, she told me that she had been forced to make the difficult decision to close her business. Her business was no longer viable. With electricity as her greatest overhead, she had to watch as her profits had become completely absorbed. It is a sad day when the carbon tax is the final straw for local small business. Yet another of my local small businesses, Foodworks Burpengary, approached me with examples of the carbon tax that they were paying in a direct and itemised carbon tax charge of $1,300 for just one month alone. When I directly raised this with the Prime Minister during question time in this place, the Prime Minister's response was simply to deny yeah. that small businesses Disgrace. pay the carbon tax. Disgrace. And I had to go back and somehow try to explain to Craig from this local business that although he could see in black and white an itemised mm. carbon tax bill, the Prime Minister was telling him that he wasn't paying the carbon tax. Mm. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would challenge every Labor member of this place to walk into the small businesses in their electorate and explain to their constituents that this, this alternative reality of the modern Labor Party finds itself in, whereby a business has an electricity bill with an itemised carbon tax component, yet somehow the Labor Party thinks that they actually don't pay the carbon tax. Mr Deputy Speaker, for a carbon tax that, according to the Labor Party, was not supposed to have real impacts on costs for individuals, I have been receiving an overwhelming feedback from, from local residents. Residents who are only now starting to realise just how much carbon tax they are paying for Labor's new tax. Just in the last fortnight, I have heard from residents of a retirement living park in my electorate. The Island Breeze Homeowners Committee contacted me to share their concerns about rising electricity costs. And Neville from the committee shared that residents from Island Breeze Resort have already noticed a jump due to the carbon tax and are very concerned to have been informed that their electricity charges will continue to rise directly because of the carbon tax. For Neville and other independent retirees of my electorate who are already facing an uphill battle with low interest rates and high costs of living, they are extremely concerned about their future. They are finding themselves in a difficult circumstance where they are considering how they will manage to pay their bills and live within their limited budgets. At the recent Longman Seniors Forum that I held, the very first question put to me was about the carbon tax. They are concerned because the only certainty with this carbon tax is that they are going to be paying more and more for their electricity and for their groceries. Even this week, we have seen that Telstra is now considering charging its customer fee, to, to increasing its customer fee to cover its own carbon tax costs. The widespread ramifications for the carbon tax are only beginning to be known now. People are only just beginning to feel the pain that this tax is going to bring. And new taxes are not going to help small business. They're not going to help them get ahead. The carbon tax is not going to help. It is going to hurt. And as Sir Robert Menzies said in his wisdom, he identified that real tax reductions are the best of all incentives to increase effort, earnings and production. They are the best incentive to encourage a reduction in emissions. A carbon tax will not have any environmental impact whatsoever. The more I hear stories from people and businesses in my community, the more determined I am to ensure that my electorate is free from this carbon tax. I remain absolutely committed to abolishing the carbon tax. Abolishing the carbon tax will be the first order of business of a coalition government. One, on the first day of parliament, under a coalition government, we will introduce legislation to get rid of the carbon tax. The people of Australia deserve better than the lies and the uncertainty that they are getting from this Labor government. Right. The people of Australia deserve hope, reward and opportunity, which is why I cannot support these bills. As the Leader of the Opposition said in this place tonight, he can be believed when he says there will be no carbon tax under a government he leads. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Here, here. <coughs>